This is Imaging of Adrenal Cysts and Myelolipomas. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. So we're going to continue our discussion on leave-alone adrenal masses. Last time we discussed adrenal hemorrhage. Now we're going to talk about adrenal cyst, as well as a differential diagnostic consideration, gastric diverticulum, and myelolipoma, and its malignant differential diagnosis of retroperitoneal liposarcoma. By leave-alone adrenal masses, I mean that these are benign masses that are not functioning. They do not secrete hormones. So starting with a case, this is a patient who had a non-contrast CT scan. You can tell it's non-contrast because the aorta is not enhancing. And there's a well-circumscribed homogeneous left adrenal mass. So the next step is to place a region of interest on that mass. And we get a Hounsfeld unit density of 8. And you might think, OK, that's consistent with an adrenal adenoma because it's 10 or less, right? There's also a punctate calcification within the wall of this mass, as you can see here, denoted by the green arrow, which is a clue as to what this is. So if we look at the in-phase and opposed-phase T-weighted images from the patient's MRI, you can see this left adrenal mass does not lose signal on the opposed-phase image. It does not drop out. So therefore, it's not consistent with a lipid-rich adrenal adenoma. On the T2 coronal series, the mass is extremely bright similar to water or fat density. You can see it's iso-intense to adjacent fat. There's also a small amount of layering T2 hypo-intense debris within this structure. And then on the T1 fat-suppressed post-contrast series with gadolinium, the mass is completely non-enhancing. It also is dark on T1, which is consistent with fluid. And this is typical for an adrenal cyst. The patient also had an ultrasound of the left upper quadrant here, showing that the mass is anechoic with increased through transmission and there's an imperceptible wall consistent with a cyst. Just on these images alone, it's difficult to tell is this an adrenal cyst or a renal cyst, but we know from the cross-sectional imaging that it's arising from the adrenal gland. Here's another example of an adrenal cyst. You can see that this time it's on the right side, and it's T1 dark. It's following the same signal as the CSF in the spinal canal since it's fluid, and then it's also T2 bright, iso-intense to the adjacent CSF. Remember, water is T2 bright, and both H2O and T2 have a 2 in it. And then on post-contrast T1 images, you can see that it's not enhancing. It just has a thin peripheral wall of enhancement, which corresponds to the surrounding adrenal gland. So adrenal cysts are not very common. There are two major types. There's the simple type, which is endothelial line, that tends to be dark on T1, bright on T2, following simple fluid, like in this case. And then there's also the pseudocyst, which has no epithelial lining, those usually arise following adrenal hemorrhage, and those are more likely than simple cysts to be symptomatic. And they may have a complicated appearance and have a T1 bright appearance if there's hemorrhage within them, which can also be T2 dark. And there may be peripheral calcification. So that initial case I showed you with the CT ultrasound and MRI uh, was likely a pseudocyst. And these will not enhance because it's just a cyst, it's just water. And if these become symptomatic, they can be removed laparoscopically. So if we go back to that initial CT scan of the left adrenal cyst, again, the density is 8 Hounsfeld units. This patient actually had a CT scan four years earlier, and the adrenal cyst had a density of 21 Hounsfeld units. And you can also see it was a little smaller before, and it has since developed calcification in the wall. So this is a typical evolution for a hemorrhagic uh, pseudocyst that was a little dense previously and has become more simplified over time. Now, water tends to have a density of zero Hounsfeld units, but actually ranges from 20 to negative 10. So eight Hounsfeld units is consistent with simple fluid, and 21 is a bit hemorrhagic or proteinaceous. Now, if you recall from the adrenal adenoma lecture, there's some overlap here, right? Because adrenal adenomas have a density of 10 Hounsfeld units or less. So these are sometimes misdiagnosed as adrenal adenomas, but that's okay in, in the respect that these are completely benign it's not okay in the fact that these are completely non-functioning. There is never a functioning simple adrenal cyst, whereas adenomas can be functional. So you want to try to differentiate them if you can. All right, so here's another case. This is a right upper quadrant ultrasound showing the liver, kidney, and then this anechoic cystic structure with increased through transmission and imperceptible walls. So statistically, this would almost always be a renal cyst, but not in this case because we're talking about adrenal cyst, right? <laughs> So if we look at the CT scan for this patient, there's the right adrenal cyst sitting on top of the kidney. But what don't you see that you would expect to see for a renal cyst? Right, there's no claw sign, meaning there's no claw of renal tissue surrounding this structure, which would indicate that it's renal in origin. It's just sitting on top of the kidney, and that's because it's arising from the right adrenal gland. 
and you can see that there is a claw sign from the adrenal gland there. There's that claw of adrenal tissue arising posterior to the inferior vena cava where you'd expect the right adrenal gland to be. And this is a typical adrenal cyst. The density there is 11 Hounsfeld units, which is consistent with water. It's in that range of 20 to negative 10. And what else do you see on this patient? Just an incidental finding. Right, there's a fatty liver. The density of the liver is quite low. And that's why it was also a bit echogenic on ultrasound, if you happen to pick that up. Let's look at another case. Here's a non-contrast CT scan showing an ovoid cystic lesion in the region of the left adrenal gland. If we measure the density of that lesion by placing a region of interest, we get Hansfeld unit density of 4, which is consistent with fluid. So this is probably a left adrenal cyst, right? Hmm. Now, if we look at this image, it's actually communicating with the stomach. The patient had a prior study where oral contrast had been administered, and you can see that there's oral contrast extending from the stomach into this structure posteriorly. And this is typical for a gastric diverticulum. Deception. <laughs> So these most commonly arise from the posterior aspect of the gastric fundus. When they're fluid-filled, they can mimic a left adrenal cyst or even an adenoma. And when they're collapsed because of the soft tissue density of the stomach, they can mimic an indeterminate adrenal mass. So it's key to look for communication with the stomach. And even if your current study does not have oral contrast, the patient may have a prior study where oral contrast was administered, which is extremely helpful in confirming the diagnosis. Here's a different patient showing a left adrenal region nodular density. And if you look closely, there's actually gas within it. And you can see that a bit more evidently on the lung windows. So the diverticulum might contain physiologic gas from the stomach, and that's also diagnostic of a gastric diverticulum. And it may be helpful to apply lung windows to detect that. Now, when you're trying to determine if you're dealing with an adrenal lesion or a gastric diverticulum, it's often helpful to look at multiple imaging planes. This is a different case showing a cystic appearing lesion in the region of the left adrenal gland on coronal reformatted images. But when you look at the axial images, you can see clearly that it's arising from the posterior aspect of the stomach, and this is just another gastric diverticulum. Here you can see some gas in it as well, which is physiologic and diagnostic of a diverticulum. Here's another case. This is a T2 axial image, and you see the cystic structure posterior to the stomach. So what do you think that is, a gastric diverticulum or an adrenal cyst? It's really hard to tell on this image alone. If I show you a CT scan, though, what do you notice? Right, there's no oral contrast extending into this structure, so you're thinking it's probably an adrenal cyst. So the next thing you'd look for is the claw sign. And on this image, it's nicely shown a claw of adrenal tissue surrounding this adrenal cyst. So that shows you that this cystic structure is arising from the adrenal gland. That's also evident on this CT scan image, a claw of adrenal tissue around the cystic lesion, and again, it does not have oral contrast within it. And the coronal reformatted CT image also shows both of these findings nicely. Okay, now that you're all professors of the gastric diverticulum, let's look at a different adrenal mass. This is a case showing a CT scan of the upper abdomen with intravenous contrast, and there's a soft tissue and fat density mass in the left upper quadrant posterior to the stomach and medial to the spleen. On these images alone, it's difficult to tell exactly what organ is this mass arising from. Looking at the coronal images, you can see that it's sitting on top of the left kidney, and you don't see a claw sign, meaning it's not arising from the renal parenchyma. That green arrow shows a lack of a claw sign. And this is at the same level of the adrenal gland. So this is a mass arising from the left adrenal gland, and this is a myelolipoma. So myelolipomas are rare benign neoplasms that contain macroscopic fat and hematopoietic bone marrow elements. That accounts for the soft tissue. So they're well-defined masses, and they contain varying degrees of fat and soft tissue. And fat density, you can measure with a region of interest at negative 30 to negative 90 Hounsfeld units. But often on CT scan, you don't even need to do that. You can just visually see that it's the same density as the surrounding macroscopic fat within the abdomen and the subcutaneous fat. So here's an example where the myelolipoma is completely fat density, and it's actually difficult to see but you do see a claw of adrenal tissue surrounding this fat density mass. It's isodense to the surrounding periadrenal perinephric fat, and it can blend in. Here's a different but similar example of another purely fat density left adrenal myelolipoma. And myelolipomas can also have very little fat density. So here's an example of just a small amount of fat density within an otherwise soft tissue predominant myelolipoma. And that blue arrow is pointing to the small area of macroscopic fat within the lesion.
It's also not unusual to have small calcifications within myelolipomas. Up to 30% can have calcifications, here denoted by the green arrow. Uh, just to keep in mind, other adrenal masses that can have calcifications include pheochromocytomas and adrenal cortical carcinomas. And hemorrhage is a potential complication of myelolipoma, but it's very uncommon and typically only seen when these tumors become large, more than 4 centimeters in size. The nice thing about myelolipomas is they're completely benign. There's no risk of malignant transformation. Here's an example as to how calcifications within a myelolipoma might look on plain film. On this frontal view of the abdomen, there are these amorphous calcifications within the right upper quadrant. Here's the correlative coronal CT image showing those calcifications as well. Now, here's the main differential diagnosis you do not want to confuse myelolipoma with. In the left upper quadrant of this contrast-enhanced CT image, there's an amorphous soft tissue and fat density mass in the same location as that initial myelolipoma that I showed you. But what's different about this lesion? Well, it has ill-defined margins, and if you look closely, you can see that it's actually displacing as opposed to arising from the left adrenal gland, denoted by those green arrows. So is this arising from the left kidney? Well, if we look at additional axial images of the CT scan here, you could see that it's amorphous and ill-defined, it's fat and soft tissue density, but it's displacing as opposed to arising from the left kidney. It's not, you don't see a claw sign there. It's also displacing the adjacent abdominal bowel. And it has, again, mixed soft tissue and fat density. And this is typical for a retroperitoneal liposarcoma in the differential diagnosis for myelolipoma. The difference is it arises from the retroperitoneum as opposed to the adrenal gland. And it actually displaces or invades the adrenal gland and the adjacent structures. A key differentiating feature is that it's not usually well-defined. It tends to be very ill-defined and aggressive looking as in this case. This one was biopsied and it yielded well-differentiated liposarcoma. And just a tip when you're biopsying a lipomatous mass is always target the soft tissue density regions. Otherwise, the pathology might come back as a nonspecific lipomatous lesion, which may not be helpful. Now, how do myelolipomas appear on MRI? Well, here's an in-phase and an opposed phase chemical shift series showing that there's a right adrenal mass. It has mixed high and low signal. And do you see the areas of high signal dropping out on the opposed phase image? No, not really. They remain fairly bright. But if we look at this T1 fat saturated image above, this mass suppresses, the fat signal suppresses within it, which is typical for macroscopic fat. And that's the same type of fat that we have in the subcutaneous fat and the abdomen. Notice how that's also becoming dark on this T1 fat saturated image. And if we look at this T1 fat saturated image with gadolinium, the mass is only slightly enhancing. The fat signal areas are not, which is typical for myelolipoma. They can have varying degrees of enhancement, but it's only the soft tissue components that will enhance. Note also how it's well circumscribed, unlike a liposarcoma, and it's separate from the right kidney. It's not an angiomyolipoma. So again, unlike adenoma, myelolipomas have primarily macroscopic fat, meaning they'll lose signal on the fat-saturated sequence, which is diagnostic of myelolipoma. And you can think of macroscopic fat as fat you can see. The, all the fat you can see just by looking on CT is macroscopic fat. You can put an ROI on that and get a density of negative 30 to negative 90, but it's also apparent visually. And contrast that with the adenoma, which has the microscopic or intracytoplasmic or intracellular fat, which will lose signal on the T1 opposed phase image. Now, interestingly, even though MRI is very specific for myelolipoma, it can be a little more laborious to make the diagnosis just because you have to look at multiple sequences as opposed to CT with macroscopic fat. You can just see it evident on a single image. This is the same patient's T2 coronal and T2 axial images showing that right adrenal myelolipoma, but it's very difficult to say this is a myelolipoma just on these images alone because it's a T2 bright mass. You might even wonder, is this a complex adrenal cyst? Is it a pheochromocytoma? But if you look at the T2 fat saturated image, the fat density areas uh, partially suppressed. Those other areas that remain bright are not fat density. That's probably soft tissue there. So just keep that in mind that on T2 images, not only is fluid bright, but also fat. And here on this T2 fat saturated image, the CSF remains bright, but the subcutaneous fat, the macroscopic fat, loses signal. All right, that's it for adrenal cysts and myelolipomas. Thank you for your attention. Hey, if you enjoyed this video lecture, I'd really appreciate it if you left a review and subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts.
You can also subscribe, like, and even comment on YouTube so that others can find it. Please share with a friend and visit RadiologistHQ.com for additional material. Thanks.